Well, good afternoon, everybody, and a, a warm welcome to everyone who's joined us today for our second COVID-19 employment webinar. Um, I'm Brad Hutchison, a partner at Burnus Paul in our employment team, and I'm joined today by Jane Skio, who's also an employment partner in the team. Um, and Jane is the pioneer of these sessions. Also, it was uh, Jane's. It was Jane's suggestion that we started doing these seminars and they've become, and they've become uh, hugely popular, uh, huge, which is great. Uh, which is which is great. Um, the structure of the session then is Jen's going to speak generally about furlough and then we're going to go through some of the questions that we've received in advance of the session today. Um, there's clearly a need for, for the information that we're looking to share today. We've had over 300 people looking to sign up for the session. Um, and so on that, on that issue, I just wanted to mention a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, can you please ensure that you keep your mute button on at all times just to limit the background noise? Um, when everybody joins the call, we automatically mute you. Um, but if you could just ensure that you keep that mute on throughout, that would be really, really helpful. Um, there will be an, op an opportunity to ask questions as the session goes on through the WebEx chat function. Um, you can send those questions marked for everyone so everyone sees them, or you can send them direct to the Bernice Paul Q&A address. Um, we've received a lot of questions already. So what I was going to suggest was perhaps if you've got questions on furlough, um, given that we've got, I think, over 200 people on the line. Um, if you perhaps hold off until you hear what Jen has to say on furlough and the Q&A session that Jen and I will do on furlough, and then if you've still got questions on that, then please do post them and we'll pick up as many as we possibly can. Um, given the numbers, we're not going to open the floor for discussion at the end, um, just because we think it would be mayhem. Um, but you know, if you've any other questions that we don't answer today, then please do contact your normal burner support Ernest Paul support person or myself or Jen, and we'll do all we can to, to answer those questions for you. Um, I should say you're not able to take yourself off mute, I don't think, at any point during the conversation, and I appreciate you'll not be able to type in questions either. So again, please feel free to pick up with us afterwards. I do need to emphasise that the nature of the session means that we can only really provide general advice. Um, we can't advise you on individual circumstances, and a lot will come down to the provisions within your own contracts of employment, etc. But obviously really help uh, really keen to help you with individual questions uh, after the session's completed, if that would be helpful. The other thing to let you know is we have been notified by Webex that they have had some capacity issues. So um, with everyone working from home and, and trying to communicate remotely. If it looks like there's any kind of problem with the Webex as we're going on with it today, then what we'll do is just call a halt to the webinar um, and we'll reconvene at another date and time and let you know when that is. So. Um, just finally, before I, I hand over to Jane, the session is going to be recorded today so that we can make it available to everyone afterwards. So you'll be able to get a copy of the session from our COVID hub on the Burnus Poll website. And the plan is to session, sorry, complete the session by half past one at the latest. So with all that housekeeping out of the way, I'm going to hand over to Jane, who's going to do a general introduction to you on furlough. Jane. Thanks, Morag. Um... I thought I was going to actually have to exit the webinar myself there at the start with all that feedback. <laughs> but I think we've got there finally. But yeah, as Morag says, if everyone can just keep double checking there on mute um, so that it's as easy to, to hear for everybody. Um, so on furlough, a word that basically nobody had ever heard of or used until um, Friday night. Um, you may all have seen, um, we've produced a, a guidance note on what we know at the moment, but basically, in a nutshell, the Chancellor has announced this unprecedented job retention scheme, um, which I, I should say the details of which are still to be released. So what we're all working from at the moment is effectively the, the terms of the announcement that you made um, on Friday and then some other information that has been pushed out through the government website. Um, other people are kind of waiting ad hoc reports from Treasury sources and that sort of thing. But I, I do I would stress that generally speaking, um care needs to be taken um that the details of the scheme are still awaited and ultimately um we're gonna have to wait for that oh, yeah. anything definitive can be, um, can be set in stone. 
Hi there okay. to the person that just joined. If you could just place yourself on mute because we've got quite a few people today. So uh, we need to make sure um, everybody's on mute. Thanks. Um, so um, it came against the backdrop of the closure of schools, bars, restaurants, etc. And the message from the government was effectively don't lay people off don't make redundancies and we will fund up to 80% of pay for those people um, if you keep them on, on your payroll in a nutshell. Um, I'm sure that the Chancellor didn't count on there being as many employment law nerds <laughs> out there as us um, who are then trying to unpick that detail and make it, make it workable. Um, but uh, the process uh, I think will involve or we know will involve employers contacting HMRC and um, making an application for a grant to cover what they've termed as most of the wages for the workers um, who are furloughed and um, rather than being made redundant. Um, the scheme is open to all employers regardless of size, sector, so that's charities, public sector, private companies, sole traders. If you have an employee, then you're eligible um, to participate in the scheme. Um, and it covers everybody who's paid through PAYE, um, so not just employees, and um, that may also cover um, what we would call the kind of LIMB workers under the Employment Rights Act. Um, the government has set the maximum of the reimbursement at £2,500 a month, um, which they've worked out as being above the median income um, for workers within the UK. We're going to come on to talk about, I know that's one of the big questions that you've all got, we're going to come on to talk about um, what does that actually mean, how's that pay made up. Um, it's going to be backdated to the 1st of March 2020 um, and it will be in place for at least three months going forward. Um, the Chancellor was very clear to say that there is no limit on the funding available um, under the scheme and um, he will extend the uh, duration of the scheme if necessary. Um, and that payments of the grants will be made within weeks of the announcement. So that's weeks as of last Friday um, with an aim of the end of April um, for the payments. So those are the headline terms. Um, one of the, the big questions we've been getting um, as a team is a, which workers will be covered under the scheme. Um, there's a lot of unknowns. What we do know is that to benefit from the protection under the scheme, you're going to have to designate um, workers as furloughed workers. Um, that, I think, in effect means that you will be saying to them, you have to take a leave of absence from work. So that's a really critical point. They cannot undertake any work for the employer if they're furloughed. Think of it as, um, a career break, a, pay, a, a paid leave of absence, they are not undertaking any work for you. So it doesn't cover individuals who are on reduced hours or short time working. Um, they, they don't benefit under the scheme. Um, I think um, realistically that means that you could have a really clear cut situation where your premises have been shut down either by the government directing that to be the case or because you have chosen to do so for economic reasons. Um, if you send everybody home and designate them as furloughed workers because they can't work from home, um, then, then they would be covered. It may be that other employers are not shutting their premises down but are actually just choosing to furlough a portion of their work workforce. Um, they would also be covered. Um, so effectively that is the that is the headline badge um, of workers that are covered um, by the scheme. Bigger and more difficult area is which workers will not be covered by the scheme. At the moment um, our understanding is that people who are currently covered by the SSP um, regime which has been vastly extended as, as you all know um, would not benefit from the scheme because they are not furloughed workers at that stage. They are workers who are absent from work due to self-isolation, illness, um, or um, maybe don't have symptoms, but have been 
under the guidance of the government told that they need to stay away from work. There has actually been some commentary over the last few days saying that the government might extend the scheme to cover people who are um, away from work under those circumstances, self-isolation or in a vulnerable category, or even looking after children because the schools have closed. Um, but that has not been um, publicly announced yet and it's not in, in any detail. So I think caution needs to be exercised on that. If you can do your work from home, um, then you don't get to be a furloughed worker. Um, and as I said earlier, um, those employees who are on reduced hours um, wouldn't qualify. Um, employ, I think this is a really important point. The, the theme running through the policy is that um, it, the furloughing should be done with a view to avoiding making redundancies. So if your business is not hand on heart in a position where they would be considering making redundancies or there's a redundancy risk facing your business as a result of COVID-19, um, then I think that there would be a question mark over whether or not um, the furloughed workers there would qualify for protection. Um, it should be noted though that some people might switch categories. So you might have somebody who starts off as being in self-isolation um, or is absent uh, due to illness um, and they're in the non-eligible category and then they, they come out of that period and say, I am now safe and willing to work. Um, and you say, OK, then we're furloughing you because you cannot work from home and we we can't have you on our premises because we've been shut down or, or otherwise are facing redundancies. Um, on a practical level, how do you make the claim under the scheme? It will be operated by HMRC. We will have details um, soon, we hope, of how this is going to um, be operated on a practical level. But I mean, in fairness to HMRC, they're nobody's favourite organisation, but they are, they are having to come up with a, a whole new practical process and implement it under extreme pressure. It should be an online portal um, into which you put uh, details of the worker, um, their earnings, and I'm imagining some sort of declaration will need to go with that to say this person has been designated as a furloughed worker to avoid a redundancy situation. Um, so that's how it works on a practical level. Um, what wages will be covered? I know a number of you have put in some questions on this, so I'll maybe kind of park that until your section, Morag. But what we know at the moment is that it's 80% of pay for a worker up to a maximum of £2,500. Um, we think that that 2500 is gross, but that's not been confirmed. Um, and we think that that 2500 is 80%. Um, so you could conceivably have a worker that's on 31250 per month gross and they would get the maximum two and a half um, cap. But what actually goes into that um, that funding um, is still up for um, up for debate and up for question. So main point to know is be careful that you don't overpromise to employees to say you'll get 80% of your normal pay um, up to two and a half thousand pounds without caveating it by saying subject to what the scheme rules are um, because it might be that you need to make deductions from that um, or they'll get less in their hand potentially. Um, how do you communicate this to workers? <coughs> Excuse me. I think um, it's really, really difficult. There are a number of um, our clients who have done kind of holding letters at this stage just to get uh, something out there to staff to say, look, you'll be aware of the scheme um, and we fully intend to make use of it. Uh, once we've got further information, we'll let you know. Others have actually moved on um, to a second stage of designating workers as being furloughed workers. Um, and we've been helping them pull together those, those communications. They're incredibly important to get right. Um, as I said in the note, the last thing you want to do as a business at this challenging time is inadvertently create contractual obligations for yourself when actually what you're meaning to say is we'll give you the benefit of the scheme but um, what that might translate to in an employee communication could be a promise directly from the employer to the employee that you will pay them so just please do take care on those sort of communications um, 
there are a number of outstanding questions. Um, I think at this point I'll hand over to you, Morag, because my short list that I prepared on the guide uh, over the weekend, I think has grown exponentially and we're probably now at about a million, it feels. Is that probably right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it probably is. Thanks, Jen. Um, as these seminars go on, we can. the plan is to do one for um, each Wednesday for the next four weeks at least. And I'm just thinking over that time, we can see how far down that gin bottle in the background Jen gets <laughs> gets through. I see it's fairly full at the moment, but that might change over time. Um, if we run through then some of the questions that have, have come through, and we have had a lot, so what we've tried to do is split them into different topics. Um, so how do you implement furlough? What are, what's the qualifying criteria? Um, how do you select people for furlough? furlough and holidays, furlough and sickness absence, pay, um, and um, also, you know, what if you want to do other work while you're on a period of furlough? So th they are the kind of key topics and we'll run through the questions under each of those headings. Um, Jen's already covered some of it, so um, that's obviously helpful. Um, but if we start with how do you implement, um, there is this question of, well, do you just um, tell your staff that you're placing them on furlough or do you need to get their agreement before you do that? Um, strictly speaking, our advice has been yes, you do need to get their agreement because you're looking to change their status. Um, however, from a practical point of view, that might prove to be very difficult. What we are experiencing with clients is we have some clients who are saying to us, we need to we need to do this now, we need to do this immediately. If we don't, the business will close today, tomorrow. Um, we have other clients who are saying to us, you know, we've paid our staff till the end of March. Um, we're going to start having discussions with furlough and seek to get agreement from the individuals to be placed on furlough. So there is that kind of range of options about how you do um, implement the, the furlough status. Um, there is a risk, obviously, if you implement without agreement, there is a risk that employees could resign and claim constructive unfair dismissal, but in the kind of current climate, I think if you're faced with a choice of furlough or redundancy, you're you're more likely to to accept furlough. Um, the other issue, I suppose, that's come up there is: do you need to do collective consultation? Um, potentially, yes, if you're looking to implement furlough and you've got twenty or more employees that don't agree and you are trying to get their consent, then potentially you're in a collective consultation situation. And I suppose one thing to think about for those of you that don't already have employee forums in place or a recognised trade union, um, do you want to start looking at having a forum in place now, not just in the context of any consultation on furlough, but I suppose more generally in relation to, to consultation with your staff and letting them know what's what's going on during what is obviously a very, a very difficult time. Um, Will you have to prove, in relation to qualifying criteria, one of the questions we've been asked, will you have to prove that the individual would otherwise be made redundant in order to put them on furlough? Our response to that has been, you know, the, the scheme is big and bold and that is deliberately so. The government has introduced it to try and keep as many people in work as possible. Um, on the face of it, yes, the messages that have come out from the Chancellor are that furlough is intended to be an alternative to making your staff redundant. Um, in reality, you know, how is HMRC going to be able to check whether people are actually redundant or not? Um, that's going to be quite difficult, again, given the, the position that we're in currently. So, as Jen said, it may be that when you apply for the grant in relation to furlough, you're asked to sign a declaration to say that otherwise the individuals would be at risk of redundancy. Um, but we can wait and see when the guidance comes through. Just on the guidance, actually, we've had um, indications that it's unlikely to be this week before we get the guidance. Is that right, Jen? I think that's still the position. Um, it's likely to be the beginning of next week. Is that? Yeah, I think yeah. next week it's more um, likely. Yeah. So, um, qualifying criteria for employees to claim furlough is there a length of service criteria? No, there isn't. Are all industries covered? Yes, they are. Um, as Jen said, furlough is available to individuals who are paid through PAYE. It's not restricted to particular industries, as far as we're aware. Um, what is yeah, the just to chip in there? Um, somebody had asked, does it apply to people that are office based but can work from home? Um, the answer to that is no, it doesn't apply to them because um, they are still able to work 
um, and do their job. So they should just be paid as normal. Um, it's for people who cannot work from home um, and that you're sending them home effectively. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point because I think some of the questions we were also getting was round about, well, can you um, agree with staff that they reduce their hours and you then pay them through the furlough scheme? And again, the answer to that is, is no, you can't. Um, they're either placed on furlough full time or they're continuing to work with you in some form of capacity if that's on reduced hours or working from home. Um, what is the definition of a furloughed worker? Does the worker need to be off the books to get the 80%? No, they're still on your books. They're not, it, it's effectively like a period of leave or a sabbatical. Um, they're still employees of yours and they're still on the books. It's just that they're placed on furlough for the duration of the, the furlough period. Um, can we begin to furlough staff and claim the government grant in response to a major decline in our orders and revenues, but not complete closure? So this is where you've not been required to close the business, you're still carrying on. Is furlough available to you? Yes, it is. If you have got staff who would otherwise be at risk of redundancy, even though your business hasn't closed, um, you still have access to the furlough scheme. Um, is it safe to offer our employees the job detention scheme option um, as at present, we've not been instructed to officially close down by the government, so it's very similar to the last question. Yes, it can. You can you can offer furlough now, even though your business is still up and running. Um, as Jen said, really furlough is meant to only be available for employees who are at risk of redundancy as a result of COVID-19. So if you have other staff who are at risk of redundancy for other reasons, um, technically furlough is not available to you. However, again, in reality, from a practical point of view, um, I think it's going to be very difficult for anyone to challenge at some point in the future whether your individual was at risk of redundancy because of COVID-19 or they were at risk of redundancy for another reason. Um, Jen, do you want to, I think you kind of touched on this point already, but just pick up on this question, which is, have we had any further guidance on whether people who can't come to work due to school closure, childcare commitments will be included in furlough? As I said, um, there has been a hint um, that this uh, category of um, workers might might get cover under the under the scheme because, as you'll um, no doubt have heard us say, if you if you um, dialed in, is that the right word to the first <laughs> webinar? Um, we were talking about what people's legal rights are, where they um, have to be away from work because they have to look after their their children and the the law at the moment is probably very unsatisfactory from a statutory perspective on that because there's the unpaid right to dependence leave um which is um just not fit for purpose right now really um so i think most employers are taking the approach that if you can work from home with the kids there then you know we'll hope to pay you your normal pay or we can agree something with you a, a kind of work around or um temporary reduction in paying hours. Um, but if you really can't work at all because um, of your children being at home and you needing to take care of them, then you can see from a policy perspective, the government um, will be urged to do something for people in that situation. For me, it's 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 got to be a policy decision that um, covers not only that group of people, but also people who are um, getting SSP at the moment, so self-isolating or vulnerable people who have been told they have to take the strict um, measures to stay at home because I don't think you can draw the line between who's more worthy in that situation of, of receiving um, the benefit. So I think um, ultimately it remains to be seen, um, but certainly there's a suggestion that the scheme would apply. At the moment though, please don't give an indication or a promise to those groups of workers because what we haven't mentioned at all in that commentary there is redundancy. So if at the moment, the hook for the scheme is people being otherwise at risk of redundancy. If that doesn't apply to that group of people um, at the moment, then the answer is we don't think they're in scope, um, but we will need to, we'll need to wait and see. And there is absolutely the situation where you've got someone who's working from home currently, but they're as somebody's posted in the comments, but they're you know if their if their work dries up, then it may be that they, their status changes from working from home to someone who is at risk of redundancy, in which case the furlough scheme would kick in at that stage. Um, 
This is a question that's come up quite a lot, actually. Is this question of whether you can place someone on furlough for a period of time and then bring them back into the workplace at a later date? Or the other variation that we've had on that is, gosh, it seems unfair if we've got you know 20 staff who are all doing the same job, but we are potentially looking at 10 redundant. It seems unfair that we put 10 people on furlough, they get 80% of their salary and they're not doing anything. Um, and we have the other 10 who are still having to work. So could we swap them over? Could we get a shift A and a shift B? And one week you're on furlough, one week you're back at work. Um, this is one of the questions where the answer has to be, we don't know yet, it's not clear. And I think it is something that we have to see from the guidance. I have to say, if you go back to the purpose of furlough, which is, to avoid employers making staff redundant who would otherwise be at risk of redundancy, my initial view would be you wouldn't then be able to swap people on and off furlough at different times. Um, but it may be that when the guidance comes out, it's wide enough that that is something that we're, we're able to do. I don't know, Jen, if you agree with that or if you've got a different view on that. No, I, I agree. I do, I do think, though, and we were having a discussion about this this morning in the team that you know, you might have um, you might have variations in your workload as a business, um, and some people have been talking about um, where they maybe provide support to essential um, services. So they may have pockets where they need more people, and so in that situation, um, I, I would say you would hope the government would take a sensible approach and say if you have to take someone off furlough temporarily to do something like that um, and then redesignate them as a furloughed worker. And I think that's what you would need to do is do the do the business case in inverted commas again for the furloughing at that point to say, actually, yep, again, you are potentially at risk of redundancy, so we're furloughing you again. Um, but I mean, this is really just us saying, this is how we would apply our minds to it, given the, you know, the underpinning rationale for the for the scheme is to try and keep businesses going. So you can then say to an employer, we want you to keep your business going, but actually you're not allowed to bring back any staff that you need um, to do that. Um, so yeah, definitely a, a very critical question for people, but no certainty at the moment. Yeah, definitely one to watch. Um, the other question is round about individuals who are self-employed. Um, what is the position with them, you'll have seen there's been a lot of coverage on this in the press and the Chancellor is under a lot of pressure to introduce protection for self-employed individuals. Um, the House of Commons Select Committee did um, issue a, a bill amendment for the COVID bill yesterday where they're proposing that the protection put in place is that self-employed um, or self-employed individuals um, should be entitled to 80% of their earnings based on an average of their last three years um, or £2,917, whichever is lower. So um, there's no, uh, there's been no announcement yet that there will be any protection for self-employed individuals, but just to put that on your radar, that that is something that's been discussed. Um, so that's kind of qualification for furlough, if you like, qualif uh, qualifying criteria. Um, selection for furlough, again, a question that's come up quite a lot is, um, do we need to furlough everyone or can we just furlough some of our workforce? And if we are just going to furlough some of our workforce, how do we select who it is we're going to furlough? Again, you know, nothing um, clear on that currently from the government, something that may or may not be covered by the guidelines. Um, the advice we've been given is, I suppose, you know, there's an element of common sense and approaching things from a very pragmatic perspective. If you've got a workforce where you need to furlough, um, there'll be some situations where it's very clear which rules you can furlough and which rules you can't. There'll be other situations where perhaps you go to your staff and say, look, we are going to have to furlough up to however many positions. Um, we'd like you to approach us and speak to us about whether that's something that you would be interested in or not. We can then see who would be interested in it and who wouldn't and make decisions based on that. I suppose the kind of warning that we have been given to staff, uh, sorry, to clients is be careful of any element of discrimination. So quite naturally, one of the questions that's often asked is, well, should we furlough those individuals who have childcare responsibilities or who are looking after vulnerable individuals? And it means that they can be at home. Um, the risk with that is if you're 
select an individuals on that basis and they end up receiving 80 percent of pay but you're retaining other staff and you're paying them 100 percent then potentially they're suffering a detriment as a result of that so just being careful when it comes to your selection um, and as I say, trying to, to apply a sort of common sense and um, pragmatic approach to that. Um, furlough and holidays. <laughs> this is a this is a question again. Oh gosh, I feel like every question we're starting with this is a question that comes up a lot. Um, but this is a question that's come up a lot. So, um, what if you have staff who are currently on holiday? Can you put them on furlough? Is one of the questions or another question is if you put your staff on furlough do they continue to accrue their holidays during the furlough period and then the third question is if you put your staff on furlough can you require them to take holidays during that time and the key concern for employers understandably is well i suppose if i answer the second question first yes our view is again in the absence of anything contrary in the guidelines when an individual is on furlough, they will continue to accrue their holiday entitlement during that time. Um, and a concern for employers then is if we pay, place someone on furlough for a prolonged period of time, um, once this is all over and they come back to work, our concern is that they've then accrued their full year's worth of holidays and they may seek to take their holidays at a time when actually we need everybody back in the business and how do we deal with that? Um, it's not clear whether you can say to an employee who's on furlough, right, we're now going to take you off furlough and designate you onto holidays. It's a bit similar to the, the point that Jen was dealing with previously. Um, we don't know the answer to that one at the moment. It may be possible, but my initial view on that is it's a bit like, you know, when you've got someone who's absent through sickness, the reason for their absence is sickness, it's not holidays. Similarly, if you've got someone who's um, been furloughed, the reason for their absence is furlough rather than, than holidays. Um, but that's something I think we have to, we'll have to keep an eye on to see how it develops. One of the things that a number of our clients are doing is they are saying to staff who are not currently on furlough, um, if they're working from home or um, if they're not able to come into work at the moment, is what we would like you to do is split your holiday entitlement up over the year so by the end of March um, obviously we're almost there we would want you to have taken a quarter of your holiday entitlement by the end of June we'd want you to have taken a half of your holiday entitlement so it's just something to give some thought to. Jen I don't know if you've got anything to add to that one. No um, I think you've covered it um, I do think this is going to um, be one that's a bit of a sting for employers I have to say if you furlough your staff um, with a view to avoiding redundancies and then you find in 12 weeks time you've got a big bundle of employees who have accrued um, more annual leave and haven't taken them and then want to take it when you're hoping that you've got an upturn or um, work resuming again. So um, you may just have to uh, grin and bear it potentially. Um, because I don't think you're going to be able to do like uh, an intervening period of enforced annual leave while they're on furlough. I just I don't think that that will work. You could seek to um, stop accrual of contractual um, annual leave during furlough as part of your agreement with the furloughed workers. Um, so anything over and above the working time reg amount. Um, but again, you know that would be dependent on the employee actually agreeing to it. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that's just come through there on collective consultation is a good one. If a company decides to top up the 80% so employees receive full pay, does this remove the requirement for collective consultation? Um, you would only have to collectively cons consult if you are looking to change terms and conditions, i.e. move someone onto furlough and they're not prepared to agree to that. And that's when you might end up in a collective consultation process. So just to be clear, we're not saying that you always have to do collective consultation if you're making 20 or more employees, if you're moving them on to, to furlough. Um, but in answer to the question, even if you're topping up salary to 100%, um, if you are fully following your consultation obligations um, and you are in a position where 20 or more employees are not prepared to agree to furlough, so you're, you're, you're starting collective consultation, the fact that you're paying 100% doesn't remove that obligation Although obviously it is likely to make it easier to get agreement from staff to go on to furlough if you're prepared to top up to the hundred percent rather than keep it the the eighty percent. Um, so I hope you that could helps. Potentially with that there, Morag, couldn't you? As a, we've been talking about, 
um, although it doesn't come without risk in that situation, you might decide to do a unilateral imposition yes. um, yes. to avoid engaging the collective consultation obligations. You may get to the point, especially if you're offering 100% of saying with effect from X date, this is what will be happening. It's then up to the individual employees to decide if they're going to um, resign and claim constructive dismissal as a result of that, which would feel a bit sketchy I think if I were advising the employee in that situation um, or alternatively um, you know go along with it and then sue you for any perceived underpayment of wages but there should probably not be any underpayment if you're if you're going with 100% so unilateral impositions in your back pocket if you really are um, looking to avoid the collective uh, consultation obligations. Um, I see, I know there's other collective consultation questions coming through. I'm going to move on just now just to furlough and sick pay, but we'll try and pick those ones back up at the end if we possibly can. Um, again, Jen's covered it to some extent already, but the, the kind of questions around about sick pay. So um, one would be if we furlough employees, what happens if they're sick during the period of furlough? Do they move from furlough leave to sick leave and then back in, on to sick? Our view would be no. Once they're furloughed, their status is furlough. Um, so they wouldn't then kick back into sickness absence um, and uh, their entitlement to any enhanced sick pay wouldn't kick in at that stage. Um, if an employee was required to self-isolate due to medical issues, can you please confirm if they should be furloughed? It seems a bit unfair that they may only get SSP um, depending on their contract as they've been told to self-isolate. So this is a scenario where you've got someone who's already self-isolating and receiving sick pay only and that might just be SSP if you don't have enhanced sick pay entitlement. Um, and then they have colleagues who are furloughed and receive 80% of their salary. And I take the point that it does seem a bit unfair. Um, for the period that they were self-isolating under government guidelines, they would only be entitled to sick pay. But if it gets to a stage where that individual's role is potentially at risk of redundancy and they would be furloughed, then you could move them on to furlough um, and they would become entitled to the, the 80% in the same way that other staff would. Um, if an employee is self-isolating on coronavirus SSP and we have to close or lay them off, when does the furloughed period begin? So this is where you've got, it's a bit similar to the last question, I guess, where you've got staff who are already just on SSP as a result of self-isolation, when would their entitlement to the 80% kick in? And again, it will come down to when did they move off the sickness absence and on to furlough? So at what point have you reached a view that their role is at risk of redundancy and if you didn't put them on furlough you would be having a redundancy conversation with them. Um, Jen, any other points on the sickness absence and furlough that you want to cover before I move on to pay? Um, pay, again, a question that's been asked a lot. Um, when the government have said that they're going to pay 80%, what does that mean? 80% of what? Is it gross pay? Is it net pay? We don't know the answer to that currently. At that, I, I, fairly sure is something that will be covered in the guidelines. Um, but the other question that's been asked a lot on pay is, is it based on just your basic salary pay or is it based on your full benefits um, and your full package? Again, at this stage, we don't know the answer to that. We don't know if it will also include the value of any benefits. Um, there is, of course, the option that if you do furlough staff because it's effective if you're if you seek their agreement to do it, which strictly speaking you should do, but again we accept many employers are not in a position to do that. But if you do seek to change their contracts so that they're placed on furlough, you could also seek to agree any changes to terms and conditions and benefits during that period um, if you want to have clarity on on what benefits that should be paid and, and which shouldn't. Um, the question that's come up a lot as well is, well, will pension entitlement continue? So if you've got an, a member of staff who's on furlough, should you continue to pay their pension contributions? There's been kind of mixed commentary on this as well. I have seen some views expressed that actually the, the um, anticipation is that the government guidelines will say that you can take a pension holiday for the period of time that the individual is furloughed. Um, but again, that's something that we really need to, to see when the guidelines come through. Um, Can I just add on that, Morag? Um, I think this is where, um, as I said before, the terms of your communications with your staff are really, really critical. Um, because what, what I've realised when I've been kind of 
trying to articulate it in staff communications is there's a real difference between um if you think of it in two stages what the employer is claiming for from the government and might receive that's kind of part one um, and part two is what do you then pass on and what does the worker receive in their hands? Because part one, so the claim um, the Chancellor had referred to as 80% um, costs could be claimed by the employer. So on one view, actually, your claim is to the to HMRC and then you might be claiming 80% of things like um, you know, national insurance contributions that you're obliged to make, the pay, overtime, uh, pension contributions, you get that bundled up, up to a maximum of two and a half thousand pounds from the government. And then what you pass on um, after deductions is going to be potentially less to the employee. So um, I'm not wanting to overcomplicate it at all, but I just think be really careful that what gets told to employees just now doesn't then end up in disappointment when actually in their hand they end up with less money than they think 80 percent of my pay actually means it's, it's a really good point um the other question that we've been asked on pay as well of course is what if you've got individuals with variable hours so if you've got people that are on zero hours contracts or if you've got um employees who do paid overtime and that impacts on their income. How do you, what is it 80% of? Um, again, the commentary on this has been, or there's been some indication that the government are likely to base the 80% based on individuals payment that they received in February, um, which is obviously a shorter month, which might mean that that payment is, is lower than elsewhere. We've had conversations with clients about if you've got someone on, who's on a zero hours contract, um, as I say, how do you calculate what the 80% would be, 80% of what? Um, should it be February? Should it be a period of 12 weeks prior to the payment being made and taken an average? And what if we get it wrong? What if we end up paying them less than what they're entitled to? Um, or what if you know, it works out that the money that we get back from the government is more or less than we may have paid them in advance? So our answer to that has been no clear guidance on it. You could probably do it based on February. You could probably do it based on the 12 weeks prior to you implementing the furlough period. Um, and if it turns out that you have underpaid or overpaid the individual, what you can do as part of the agreement that you enter into with them is say, this is how we're going to calculate the pay at this stage. Um, if it turns out that we've overpaid or underpaid, then we'll make up the difference. That's, of course, assuming, um, and it, it takes us on to another question about, you know, if you're applying for furlough, if you put someone on furlough now, do you pay them now and hopefully you get the money back from the government once your application for furlough has gone through? Or do you put them on furlough and you don't pay them? So you put them on a period of unpaid leave and you say to them, it's conditional upon us getting the money through from the government once we've applied for the grant. And again, much of that will come back down to your own organisation's financial position. Um, and as Jen said, you just then have to be very careful in terms of the contractual or the wording that you you set out in any correspondence to employees explaining how you're going to operate the, the furlough scheme. And the good, I guess the good news on that, I guess if you're in the second category of employers who are saying we are designating you as furlough, we're going to get the maximum we possibly can for you under the scheme. We can't pay you due to economic circumstances um, until we get that money from the government. Um, you can also explain to them that there's the backdating um, intention yeah. back to the 1st yeah. of March as well. So um, whilst you know it's going to be far from ideal for staff, um, I guess the reality is that the alternative without this scheme may have been asking people to take unpaid leave or making them redundant. So it's it's a question of doing what you can, um, being as reasonable as you can, um, and to some extent selling it to employees as well. This is the lesser of two evils. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of furlough and alternative jobs, we've been asked a question, What's the position if you furlough an employee and they then go and secure alternative employment with another employer elsewhere while they're on furlough? Can they take the 80% and also be paid the salary 
um, from another employer. Again, you'll not be surprised to hear our answer to that is not clear. We need to see what the guidelines say. Um, however, if you again, my kind of thought process on this is if you go back to the basics, what's the point of furlough? The point of furlough is to ensure that individuals who are at risk of redundancy have um, up, you know, 80% of their income. It seems to go against the purpose of the scheme to allow people to get 80% of their income from one employer and then go and work for another employer or organisation while they're on furlough. Um, the way it's come up in a slightly different context is if, if we have staff on furlough, can they then go and volunteer? Um, so, for example, obviously the NHS are looking for, I think it's a quarter of a million volunteers to go and help out. Um, I can't see there being any problems with that. I think that would be absolutely fine. I do wonder, again, if when you apply for furlough, you'll be asked to sign some sort of declaration that confirms that the individual is not working for another organisation whilst they're in receipt of furlough. Um, but again, it comes back to the point that we've made earlier about in reality, how difficult is it going to be for HMRC to check up on is somebody in receipt of furlough and are also receiving a, a separate pay from elsewhere? Um, so that's one of the questions that's come up. The other one that we've had a lot again is what if I've offered someone a new role? Um, we've put out the offer, they've accepted the offer and they're due to start with us. Can they start and immediately be put on furlough? Again, um, we had quite a debate about this one ourselves internally yesterday. One point of view was, well, yes, you can, because you know, if the qualification for <laughs> furlough is, are you at risk of redundancy? If you've just started a new role and your role is at risk of redundancy, then surely you should be entitled to furlough. Um, the counter argument to that is based on the commentary that the furlough payment will be based on your February salary. If you haven't started with the new organisation yet, you won't have a February salary with that organisation and therefore you won't be able to get 80% of that salary whilst you're placed on a period of furlough. What, um, what we did become aware of yesterday was, I think it's Martin Lewis, the, the money saving expert, had said to a number of individuals in that situation, what you should do is go back to your previous employer who you do have a February salary with and say to them, can you place me on furlough please? Um, so that I can get 80% of my, my February salary. My view is that doesn't work from a legal point of view because you're no longer an employee of the previous employer. That that relationship has been terminated. Um, so I don't think the previous employer has an obligation to then take you back on effectively and, and place you on furlough. Of course, employers could choose to do that, but I don't think there's an obligation on them to do that. I don't know if you've been... And just, that yeah, a couple of associated... Um, points on that. So we'd had a question of what if someone's on notice. Um, so they're they're working out their notice with you, they're maybe going to another job, where does the kind of obligation fall? Um, I think um, as Morag says, I don't think you can flip the obligation on to a new employer, but in those circumstances, that individual's employment was going to terminate already by reason of whatever the prompt for the notice um, being given was. So I think in that situation, um, you know, you you already have that person working under notice. You could place them on garden leave, frankly, if you were going to pay them out for their notice anyway. You could designate them as a furloughed worker for the unexpired portion of their notice if you wanted. But I don't think they then get the benefit of an extended employment relationship with you um, or um, anything else from you, frankly, because COVID-19 isn't really impacting their employment relationship with you after it, it was going to end anyway, whether their new employer decides once they start, we're going to furlough you is a matter for the new employer. Um, the other question was, what about people who have accepted offers of employment with you but haven't started working for you, especially if you've maybe um, extended out the start date to the future, should you furlough them? The guidance um, that we've had, again, coming back to Morag's point about you know, have they been receiving pay and, and on the books, so to speak, for the February payroll would mean that they, they wouldn't be. They're not working for you at the moment, so there's not a redundancy situation um, in relation to their role. So I think the answer to that is no, but understandably, they may want to look elsewhere if they if they can't wait, um, and you know, a few weeks or months perhaps to, to start their job with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Redundancy and furlough is a question that's come up and a very good question. Um, 
can you still make an individual redundant when they're potentially entitled to furlough or will that make their dismissal unfair? And of course, the question is based on the, the situation that, you know, if you're looking as the law stands, if you're looking to make an employee redundant, you have an obligation to look for alternatives to redundancy and you also have an obligation to try and mitigate the effect of the redundancy. And so if I was acting for an employee and you, you made me redundant without first considering furlough, I'm likely to argue, well, hold on, that's not a fair dismissal because you haven't fully explored all the alternatives to redundancy. The government specifically put the furlough scheme in place in order to prevent redundancies and you ignored that and you chose not to, to do that. Um, I'm not saying that you cannot make um, employees redundant um, and that you have to place everyone on furlough, but I think probably what you have to be seen to do is consider furlough in the same way that you would consider all other options to try and prevent a redundancy. And if you have a good, strong business reason why no, well, no furlough wouldn't have been appropriate in this situation, and so that's why we've moved to redundancy, I think that'll be okay. But you'll need to be able to demonstrate that you have considered furlough as an alternative to redundancy. Now, clearly that only applies to redundancies where they're being made as a result of COVID-19. So if you had ongoing redundancy programmes anyway, or you were, you're, you know, you might be looking at redundancies for other reasons that are not COVID-19 related, I don't think it's the same issue. Um, but just something to, to bear in mind. Um, I'm conscious of time, 13.23. Um, we're nearly at the end of all of the questions that we've been submitted. I'm just going to cover one of them, one more furlough question just now. And then if you don't mind, what I'm going to do is get Jen to cover this issue of lockdown and uh, whether you're allowed to attend work or not. Um, because it's something, again, that, that caused a lot of discussion yesterday um, with a view to Zen finishing up at half past one. Um, the further question I just wanted to cover was this issue of furlough, I suppose furlough and redundancy again, but in the context of final salary pension schemes, um, any of, I just want to flag to you, any of you that have final salary pension schemes, you might have provisions in those schemes that pay out very generous sums of money if employees are made redundant. So you might find you have employees who ideally you would like to furlough um, and Part of the reason for that might be because it would not be cost effective for you to make them redundant because of their final salary pension scheme entitlements. Um, the question is, you know, can we force them to furlough rather than make them redundant? The answer to that, again, is really you should be seeking agreement from your staff to furlough them. You're changing their status. Um, you could insist that you furlough without getting their consent. But in that situation, I do think potentially you do have the risk of a constructive unfair dismissal claim. Um, based on, well, it means that I'm not getting access to my pension entitlement. Of course, the unfair dismissal claim would be capped at a year's salary anyway, but just a wee warning bell for those of you that operate final salary pension schemes, just be careful with this. It's, it's probably something you want to take specific advice on. Um, Jen, anything else you want to cover on furlough or any questions we can pick up quickly on the side? Uh, just a really there. quick question, um, and I'm hoping I'm right on this, that someone had said, uh, they thought the payments from HMRC would be made direct to the employees. I'm sure the terminology used in all of the guidance is that it's the employer that claims the subsidy in effect. Um, so I've been operating on the understanding that it's going to be a payment from HMRC to the employer and that will then be passed on to the employee. Um, just shout if you think any differently, Morag. No, oh, I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, I, I'm conscious we're out of time and we have got a lot of extra furlough questions in there. Um, we will take them at the end. Once we finish the session, we'll have a look at them and we'll see if we can publish something that covers the questions that we've not been able to cover on furlough. I hope that's been really helpful. You'll see that there are so, so many questions uh, on, on furlough and we'll continue to keep you up to date as soon as we have developments. Jen, do you want to quickly just cover the question of Scotland and England working whether or not you have to go into work? Um, well, I'd rather not cover it, to be perfectly honest, because <laughs> it's really hard and not clear at all. That's why I passed um, it to you, Jen. <laughs> yeah, but thanks so much anyway for your kind gesture. Um, no, in a nutshell, um, on Friday night, no, not Friday night, when was it? Monday night, wasn't it? That was yes. the um, Prime Minister's announcement for lockdown. Um, he used some terminology that was pretty restrictive in nature about no leaving the house except um, 
if it's essential basically for work and the original tweet that came out from the government um indicating what you could or couldn't do said um stay at home and don't go to work unless you're a key worker that then changed so the the westminster position changed after that to be um don't go to work if you can work from home so um immediately unless you're in the category of premises or businesses that had been instructed to close down that then meant that actually anybody who worked in other businesses and couldn't work from home could therefore travel and go to work so that's still the position in England and Wales. There has been further clarity this morning. I don't know if you all have signed up for the government.co.uk alerts when there's changes to the guidance. If not, I'd recommend that you do. They issued something either late last night or first thing this morning with a list of premises and businesses that should close down and those that can remain open. Um, Scotland is a significantly different. Um, the First Minister of Scotland stated that um, it should only be effectively essential work um, that would necessitate leaving the house. And um, the way that she's um, subsequently clarified that is um, if staff cannot work from home, employers can ask themselves whether their business is essential to the fight against coronavirus. That could include firms making medical supplies or essential items or something essential to the well-being of the nation such as food supplies so anything that's non-essential people should not be going to work and in particular there's a divergence on construction sites um the first minister in scotland has said that construction should close unless it's involving um building of a hospital or some other essential um service to the public that might be reviewed in due course um once health and safety measures could be put in place. Whereas um, in England and Wales, the position is that uh, that work can't be done from home. And at the moment, there's no direction to close down those sites. So very difficult for um, you know national employers who have got multi-site operations throughout the UK, but just be really, really careful on that. And again, we'll keep you updated. Brilliant, thanks, Jane. The other points I just wanted to mention very quickly, um, gender pay gap reporting, the deadline's um, been extended. You may have seen that yesterday to try and take pressure off business. So if anyone's working away on gender pay gap, hopefully that relieves the pressure a little bit. Um, discussions around about the government calling up military reservists. For those of you that have anyone within your organisation who are reservists, um, just be aware that there may be a call up. I think, well, you, MOD should give you 28 days notice of any employees that are called up, but that might not be possible. You do have the right to try and um, reject to the call up, but you have to have very strong reasons for that. And just a warning, don't dismiss any employees who are reservists who are called up because that has criminal penalties attached to it. And Jen, just on tribunals, finally. Oh, you're on mute, Jen. I'm still, I'm still trying to recover, recover from swearing live, live <laughs> on air. <laughs> um, no, tribunals, uh, there's been a, a dramatic shift. Um, we have um, let clients know that basically all full hearings um, have been converted to telephone preliminary hearings for case management purposes. Basically a holding measure by the tribunal um, to give parties uh, and the tribunal enough time to work out how they can progress the case um, in light of COVID-19. There's been a lot of talk of potentially doing e-hearings, things by video conference, which should be fine for case management, a bit more tricky when there's evidence involved, but I think uh, the evidence out there seems to suggest it can be done. Um, there was an update yesterday from the tribunals to say that that's for full hearings up to the end of June hearings after that will still go ahead as scheduled at the moment but may be subject to further direction so definitely if you've got any tribunals on the go at the moment do take a look at them and work out what changes to your current timetable need to be made the eat the employment appeal tribunal for any of you who have appeal um cases on is actually temporarily closed um, for a couple of weeks due to COVID-19. Uh, I think probably just it not being feasible for full hearings to go ahead. And anything that has been set down as a full hearing after that is being converted to a case management telephone hearing. So everything's effectively being 
suspended but um if if we're handling your tribunals for you then i guess just a, a note to say kind of rest assured we're we're on top of that and we'll we'll keep you updated Brilliant. Thanks, Jane. Um, I'm going to close now because we did commit to you that we would finish by half past. We will pick up the other questions that have been asked that we've not been able to answer and, and try and get back to, to you on those. Um, we are planning to have a weekly Webex at the moment, half 12 each Wednesday, um, so that we can keep you up to date with any developments. If things change before then and it, we feel like it would make sense to have one at a different time, we will, of course, let you know that. Um, and also just to say to you, all of the material the recording of today's session, all of all of the information we're providing to you is available on our COVID hub on the website. So, you know, do go there and you'll be able to, to get a copy of information there as well. So thank you very much for joining us. Apologies for the noise at the beginning. All right. Thanks very much. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you.